All right, we're on. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. This is a, a virtual concurrent session, um, <clears throat> pre-recorded. Uh, we're um, really enjoying the Charleston Library Conference this year. Uh, there's been a lot of great sessions on like AI, machine learning, and uh, in our session today, uh, we'll be discussing new AI and data innovations in the classroom. Um, obviously, it's been popular this year, and I hope we'll be able to offer a unique perspective on the application and usefulness of AI tools and databases in a classroom setting. Um, I'm Raj Berry. I'm uh, the Director of Business Development at Overton. Overton is a novel policy citation index and great literature database, and I'll be moderating the session. I have joining with me today also Brian Cooper, who's the Associate Dean of Innovation and Learning at Florida International University Libraries. We also have Josh Nicholson, who's the founder of Site. He'll be representing Classroom AI Tools. Uh, Joe Karaganis, Director of Open Syllabus, also um, representing a novel open source syllabus arc. Archive. Um, our discussion will be a 30 minute roundtable format with 10 minutes of live QA at the end. So please do uh, um, hold your questions. Or, I mean, I think there's a chat here too if you want to use that. Uh, and the panel will be looking at those three uh, very different tools being used in classrooms. Um, and we'll be exploring their use cases, um, discussing how what they do is new, uh, discuss where they work well and where they don't. Um, we'll also explore how these new tools uh, are based on large novel data sets or leverage AI advances like large language models. Uh, and they're increasingly being used in higher ed classroom settings. Um, our tools provide a broader, more inclusive view of content and contribute to a deeper understanding of subject matter um, that we know, but <laughs> they can also add an extra layer of complexity to an already uh, quite convoluted landscape of other tools and content. So we seek to ask and contemplate uh, how we should critically evaluate them, adopt them, and then support the staff and students using them. All of these tools, as I mentioned, leverage scale or machine learning, uh, which you know, machine learning and AI is kind of interchangeable, um, and we help surface the content that might otherwise be uh, difficult to find, understand. And we also, um, importantly, we um, put existing content into perspective. Um, so some of our tools are used by instructors, others by students, um, some by support staff. So we're asking, how do we support all of these users? Um, where is that support coming from in university systems? And then once it's adopted, um, what can we learn from users or even the classrooms themselves um, where we're facilitating these new models of learning and innovation? Um, to that end, um, we're gonna hear from a librarian's perspective. That's Brian Cooper at Florida International University Libraries. And he'll be discussing the challenges and initiatives supporting textbook affordability and collection development in the context of these tools. Um, and, talking about how uh, spotting where these new technologies might be useful, uh, testing them, um, possible ways to package them, and providing advice and training for staff and student, uh, staff, student, teacher consumption. So at the end of the session, I hope that attendees will have a better understanding of what this new crop of AI and novel data tools have to offer staff and students and have a better idea of how to critically evaluate them and come away with some advice on how to tackle those challenges of having them successfully adopted. Um, so I'm going to leave room for each of us to introduce ourselves and briefly explain our technology and then we'll get started on the round table. So I'll just kick it off here. Um, as mentioned, Overton is the world's largest uh, policy citation database and discovery database of policy documents and other great literature. So we're a searchable index of policy documents, guidelines, think tank publications, working papers, pretty much anything written by or for policymakers or by a policy oriented source. Um, our mission is to support evidence-based policy making across the world um, via our platform that allows users to discover more than 9.3 million policy documents and growing uh, from over 1800 sources across uh, 32,000 organizations and from 188 countries. We uh, do try to be as language agnostic as possible as well. And then we allow our users to explore the links to each other, to academic papers, to relevant people, that's both citations and mentions of people and topics, along with other filters like uh, sustainable development goals and document types and um, institution types, organization types, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so we index the full text of policy documents so we can have that richness in our data and make those policy documents really easy to um, search and discover. So. 
Uh, our website is overton.io and my email is mirage at overton.io if you're interested in learning more. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Joe, then Josh and Brian. Thanks so much, everybody. I hope you enjoy the session. Thanks, Mirage. So I'll say a few words about what we do, but I uh, just wanted to preface by emphasizing what I think are some of the commonalities between the work that Overton and Set AI and Open Syllabus, uh, uh, what we do, uh, mostly from the perspective of uh, thinking about categories of intellectual work that um, have been underappreciated because it was very hard to treat them as first class knowledge production of the same order as research articles and books. Um, so, I mean, my background was primarily in, in my, my, my background as a scholar was primarily in writing, um, you know, papers for think tanks and um, uh, things that were never formally curated. And so I've always been interested in Overton's work from the perspective of uh, under, better understanding the relationship between sort of the formal publishing economy and the sort of gray economy of reports and um, papers that, you know, often are among the most important contributors to, to research on a particular topic, but never treated as kind of first class, <laughs> first class objects of scholarly production. Um, by the same token, there's an enormous richness of material that gets embedded in uh, citations that uh, is uh, unavailable for larger kinds of uh, um, uh, analysis or uh, unavailable as a larger resource until somebody begins to go to collect all of them and make them available in a format and with tools that can make sense of them and make that you know huge breadth of material available in a very digestible form. Uh, so that that's broadly what we've done with syllabi, where you know our sort of starting intuition was that uh, higher ed is mostly devoted to teaching, <laughs> but teaching left no durable record. Uh, the documents associated with teaching were never systematically collected or curated or cataloged, and that uh, there was a lot that could be done if you could begin to collect them at scale and understand and pick apart and then make presentable and analyzable the intellectual backdrop that goes into the creation of those documents. So uh, every syllabus involves decisions about what's central and peripheral to a field, about how to teach a subject, about what order things should be taught in. Uh, there's just an enormous richness there, there that um, that has always interested people, but was always very inaccessible because syllabi were so poorly curated. So open syllabus is the first very large scale attempt to do that. Uh, we have around 20 million syllabi now. We have a variety of tools that uh, extract that information and make it presentable to different academic audiences, teachers, students, um, curricular designers, advocates for OER adoption, and, and on. Um, we were built on the first generation of AI tools, or the, rather the first two generations of AI tools, arguably, uh, from um, early, mid-2010 natural language processing to more modern machine learning techniques. And like everybody else, we're beginning to think through the implications of the large-scale uh, language models that have you know, built very directly on those earlier uh, technologies, but introduced many more capabilities, a much more flexible approach to data that uh, uh, we're beginning to explore how to use effectively. Great, thanks so much, Joe. And um, we can go to Josh next. Yeah, thanks for that that preface, Joe. I think it connects the tools and services you know, quite nicely. So I'm Josh Nicholson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Site. Uh, I'm a cell biologist by training. Site uh, has been around for five years and is really created in response to growing uh, challenges with information overload uh, and then trust, right? How do we know what to trust? And so we've developed a next generation citation index that leverages machine learning to process millions of full text PDFs, extract out citation statements so you can see how, why, and where uh, an article, a researcher, a journal, a university has been cited. So really bringing more nuance uh, and in context um, to citations. Uh, we found ourselves in a, a pretty unique position with a lot of licensable access to scholarly articles to start to bring this kind of application to large language models. So, so providing some fact checking and grounding of you know, things like ChatGPT uh, against the scientific literature. And so we are doing a whole host of things now uh, that really you know, make it easier to discover, trust, evaluate, and, and uh, use research more effectively and with more trust. And I, I think um, 
you know, as we'll discuss, it, it becomes important to see how does this affect pedagogy? How do we introduce this to libraries? Is this something that students are going to use their own, on their own? How do we critically evaluate all these things? And so I'm excited to be here and excited to, to discuss with the, the other panel members uh, all these topics. Thanks, Josh. And Brian is up next. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Mirage. Uh, yeah, Brian Cooper from Florida International University. Just uh, some quick notes about FIU. We're the public research university in Miami, Florida, and we're currently ranked 29th overall in the U.S. And recently, we are considered the fourth ranked public university, according to America, America's Best Colleges 2024, published by the Wall Street Journal. In addition, um, we have a, what's called a quality enhancement plan, uh, which uh, allows us to interweave artificial intelligence at the micro-credential level uh, for all of our students. And the FIU libraries play a role in fostering AI literacy within our existing um, efforts for information and digital literacy. I'll add that in many ways, the libraries are uh, Switzerland or a neutral ground uh, of AI. Uh, we, we see many colleges and centers uh, working for rapid uptake of AI technologies, but our, our role to date is largely in creating uh, information that helps both students and faculty navigate all the complexities of AI as it's developing. And we create libguides on the topic, and we also interface through our many faculty liaisons to the various colleges and schools of the university. In addition, we're uh, working with uh, partners at the University of Florida on one um, example, and that's to take our existing digital libraries and create uh, some uh, kind of large data sets, textual data sets, which are uh, in some ways the first basis probably uh, to applying uh, chat GBT to uh, research, uh, for example, uh, hurricane data dating back uh, decades from Caribbean basin countries through, from our digital library of the Caribbean. But um, for this particular uh, panel session, uh, I'm most interested in uh, talking about my relationship that I've built with Joe at the open and the open syllabus group uh, pertaining to our ability to use their uh, AI and aggregation of data from national and international syllabi, but also to create uh, FIU's own data set based upon our syllabi that will help us on many different uh, aspects of library need, uh, such as collection development, uh, helping faculty with OER uptake, and some other things that I'll talk about a bit later. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Brian. I'm really excited about this panel. It has so many uh, different uh, platforms, but I think that there's this like common line amongst them. So I'm really excited to dig into the topic. So our first uh, question is, um, let's discuss what this new crop of AI and novel data tools have to offer staff, students, and libraries. Um, how should we critically evaluate them, adopt them, and then support the users? Um, let's start with Josh and then Joe and Brian. Yeah, so I think, you know, in general, when we're talking about new AI tools, you know, we are talking about large language models. So ChatGPT and the, the like, um, you know, these have really kind of taken over the world in a very short amount of time, at least, you know, the, the thought processes. And so how is this going to affect research? How is this going to affect teaching? You know, really every single industry is having these types of questions, looking at how is this extremely powerful technology going to impact us? Right. Is this something we should ban, something we should detect, something we should embrace, you know, fully? Uh, and I don't think any of us, you know, really have kind of the, the full answers here. And so at Sight, you know, we are, uh, you know, we have been for, for five years developing a solution that helps you better understand and evaluate research articles. In comes ChatGPT, uh, exceedingly easy to use, very powerful, very flexible, but really hard to trust and validate. Right? You can ask it any question, it's going to give you a very confident answer, but it could be completely made up. It could be completely wrong, right? And so this is not something that should be adopted you know, without some trust guards uh, at whole at the university or even you know, by individuals. And so we've developed a system that allows you to kind of you know, put some guardrails on there, provide citations to these sources so that from an automatic perspective, you can say, is this you know, BS or not, but then also from the user perspective, you should be able to quickly see here's what the machine says and, you know, here's what the output says. And so I think, you know, from a technical, 
Cole's point, we've developed something that you know starts to to look at this this challenge. But there's a lot more, right? How does this affect teaching? Can someone just you know take this and start writing with it? Can they turn this as a, a, in as homework? Should we be detecting this using AI detection tools? What if these AI detection tools are are not perfect? Um, and so I think you know there are a whole slew of problems that we need to address, and and maybe problems is not the right word, but a whole slew of different you know things that we need to look at with the adoption of these, right? Is and, and I think developing a framework around kind of looking at what is this tool or this service or this data source offering? Is this something that we can, you know, trust? How do we think this is going to be used within the classroom, used by researchers? But then also having a realistic perspective, right? If we don't kind of embrace these as a community, are people just going to go elsewhere, right? And so I think, you know, libraries have for a long time really kind of been this this source of evaluating technologies, you know, providing training on information literacy. And I think, uh, their their role in this is is you know extremely important right now right because we're all dealing with these massive you know information producing uh, types of tools. Thanks, Josh. Is that I think up to me, ben? Sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to give a, a short account of our history with these things. I mean, open syllabus uh, began with the idea that you could just collect documents in any shape or form and begin to extract structured information from them and then begin to make that information uh, legible and uh, useful to others. So, you know, that was a sort of machine learning problem circa 2014-15. Uh, you know, we emerged at a time when sort of the, the, the conditions were coming together for a big data approach to syllabus analysis uh, after years in which they'd been objects of interest, but very hard to collect, very hard to analyze. So you know, we flipped that from small data to big data. And nobody really says big data anymore because everything's big data at this point. But that was, you know, there was a moment when that was a very relevant uh, sort of reversal. Um, you know, the early AI and, you know, I mean, there, there, there's so much continuity in these techniques that, you know, 18 months ago, uh, we would have called all of our work machine learning, not AI. I've given up on holding holding down the machine learning uh, camp. So our, our AI tools originally uh, were mostly about extracting structured information from documents. Could you train a uh, an algorithm to understand patterns by showing it, say, ten thousand examples of dates and syllabi, or ten thousand description uh, sy syllabus descriptions, course descriptions, or ten thousand citations. So that was the sort of work that went into uh, these models, and it was all handled. You know, most of it was hand labeled. So you'd have somebody, uh, you know, marking out the spans of text that corresponded to a description or a citation. And that's how you created training sets that shaped machine learning models that then could. Uh, do that kind of pattern recognition on the next 10 million documents. That's where the efficiencies came in. You train on 10,000 examples, but you can then do the next 10 million for just the cost of computation. So, you know, for a while, that was a very specialized capability, something that we considered part of our core expertise. Uh, the LLMs are that same process, but just on steroids, orders of magnitude, more training. You know, training sets that encompass the whole internet. And so, the very narrow kinds of uh, uh, structured data extraction that we were doing from these documents to get out a description and not the surrounding elements uh, is now just a generalized capability of these models at the cost potentially of uh, not knowing whether what they're pulling out is accurate or not. Although there are ways to check that now, and that's going you know that has even in the last six months changed the way we think about the reliability of these models for doing. Uh, data extraction from raw documents. But from our, you know, I, I think broadly, that kind of very specialized machine learning is now a generalized capability that anybody can do. Um, and, you know, what, what used to be for us a very kind of specialized form of expertise is now just a generic uh, aspect of the ability of large language models to make sense of text, just like they're beginning to make sense of images and video and everything, you know, every, every other product of human creativity. But starting with text, because that's where that's still the world we live in. Uh, for me, what that well that 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 means the, the you know the barriers to that kind of textual analysis I think have uh, collapsed to a large extent. 
uh, which really pushes the question back to the aggregation of the data in the first place. Who are the aggregators? Uh, what does that control of data look like? Is it being done in a, in a form that is uh, persistent and um, you know archival and uh, responsible? Because there are all sorts of ethical issues around the collection and use of data. And so the you know I I think with with that ability to analyze documents becoming more or less universal, uh, the importance of the aggregation role becomes paramount. And uh, you know we are sort of sitting in, sitting in an odd middle position where we're collecting syllabi that contain citations that for libraries are the main objects of interest because the libraries are interested in connecting classroom and uh, library holdings via the citation. Uh, on the other end, there's syllabus authoring. Uh, so there are there are there are sort of product spaces emerging around us <laughs> that um, are capturing different parts of the the work of connecting uh, you know, connect, connecting the different facets of teaching syllabus production, making sure that the materials are available in the library. Uh, we're sort of in a in a middle position where we are trying to be. Uh, the nonprofit archive of choice for higher education in general, and to invest librarians in that archival project. So that's very important to us. And we've developed principles of stewardship that we hope can guide that process of collection and curation. Thanks, Joe. I think um, that's like a perfect place to kind of lead in and kind of mesh with our second question, which is um, getting a librarian's perspective about the challenges and initiatives supporting textbook affordability, collection development, and spotting where these uh, new technologies might be useful, uh, testing them and possible ways to package them um, with advice for training and student teacher consumption. Um, so what feedback channels do we prefer from the students, uh, the teachers, the librarians, or other broader staff? Uh, Brian, um, I'll start with you, and then maybe Joe and Josh can just uh, lead into any comments, and then we'll jump into question three right after that. Sure. Um, well, um, as, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I'm working with uh, Joe, and I received a grant uh, which brings open syllabus to FIU for three years. And we're, what we're getting basically is access to uh, the updated national and international data set. And how that's going to ultimately help FIU is we're going to be able to map out using the course catalogs that also have been processed by Open Syllabus to link uh, essentially peer reviewed uh, OER materials aligned with classes nationwide and correlating those classes with existing classes and faculty at FIU. So essentially, we'll be able to inform those faculty of what are the OAR materials that other peer faculty have selected to get our, our, our own faculty to think about adopting OAR materials. And in the state of Florida, textbook affordability is a big thing. And we have all sorts of metrics that are geared to student success. And, and that's one thing that drives uh, our, our high national rankings. So um, the ability to use AI, uh, you know, and also the internal data set of, of FIU's own syllabi uh, in a large research library, uh, such as we have with the FIU libraries, we collect over the decades, um, basically millions of books. And we can more effectively make collection development decisions in the future if we have better insights into what is happening within the classroom. So um, Open Syllabus's ability to basically parse out what faculty are using as their supplemental reading materials will help us decide what we should be collecting to reflect what's happening inside the classroom, as well as uh, that's a reflection ultimately often of uh, the faculty members' research interest as well. In terms of engaging the students, there's some functionality that we're working on developing, and that would be from within an open syllabus interface that students could conceivably use uh, if they see a particular text that's uh, assigned by a faculty member, there'll be a direct link back to the library catalog, which will tell that student if we have uh, a, a book in our collection that they can get perhaps instead of going out and buy, buying it. Uh, and of course, there's all sorts of question, questions about whether libraries, um, especially research libraries, 
and to what extent we can get involved with providing OER materials. Even if we don't actually buy the textbooks, we conceivably can get the, the metadata to the OER available textbook on the web within our catalog system. So there's a lot of creative potential there. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. I think uh, that's perfect to uh, and Josh, do you have responses uh, to that? Um, Joe, do you want to start? Um, well, just a, 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 to further, I mean, to Brian has already <laughs> explained some of the, some of what we're trying to do with FIU, which is more generally kind of core to our mission, which is to try to make the syllabus data available in contexts where it can address university problems. So that's that's become the, you know, sort of the the driving goal for us to understand where the data that we've collected across 20 million syllabi can be useful to um, addressing student needs, faculty needs, uh, larger kind of system level problems in higher ed where Part of the difficulty is that you can't see the problem because it's at scale. It, it, you know, it's 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 you know, the efforts to address it are too siloed in individual departments or programs or schools even. But you're looking really at a problem that at the system, state, and national levels that can only be addressed at those levels effectively. So for us, that includes things like course transfer credit, where um, about a third of students in the U.S. transfer. When they do, they lose on average 40% of their credits. That's the top line. <laughs> it's a big problem. And uh, the solutions to this have tended to pass through very laborious processes of manual articulation of classes. Is class A at school A the same as class B at school B? That's a problem that will never be adequately addressed by faculty review committees because it's impossibly large. But it's a very good problem for machine learning or AI. <laughs> And we've begun to put the pieces together to do that kind of, uh, you know, school by school comparison of all classes to all classes in order to identify the most similar ones that can then feed into a uh, kind of recommendation system for the decision makers and for students that are transferring, because often for them, it's a black box um, that can make this process easier, um, more easily scalable, and eventually much less traumatic for everybody involved. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have, you know, really too much to add to that, except, you know, to say generally, you know, there's a whole suite of powerful tools, you know, enabled by machine learning or, or large language models. And I think, you know, increasingly everyone is, is looking at how should we adopt these? How should we use these? Right. And so I think coming up with frameworks uh, that allow you to evaluate them, whether that's surveys, you know, whether that's, you know, evaluating the internal workings of the tool are, are all important. And I think universities are starting to look at this uh, at scale and, and putting those things in place for some of the new technologies. Of course, there's already been all these, you know, evaluation frameworks for, uh, you know, subscribing to articles and things like this. But now there's a whole suite of new tools, you know, that that we are creating and, and many others are creating outside of the ecosystem. How do we interact with them and how do we use them? How do we subscribe to them? How do we, you know, inform uh, students, researchers and, and faculty? Uh, the limitations and the the strengths of these. And so, yeah, I, I would just say, I think, you know, putting this stuff kind of in a framework is is probably a, a good step towards that because there can be some great use from some of these tools, not just uh, only challenges. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I agree. Um, and uh, that kind of also leads into question three. Um, and I don't know if you want to just kind of continue uh, what you were saying, um, because we're kind of wrapping up here where uh, we're talking about our thoughts on this intersection of technology in the classroom, how libraries can bridge the gap or vendors uh, supporting libraries. Well, yeah. let me just put the, sorry, Josh, I don't know. Well, I mean, I'll finish your point, but then I just wanted to push it back to Mirage and ask her thoughts about Overton's relationship to these questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, to finish that concluding thought, you know, I, I think, uh, universities as a whole, you know, largely through libraries need to be proactive with a lot of these new tools, right? And so, you know, individuals, students are being advertised on social media, you know, across every single channel, new tools that are directly used, uh, you know, for for writing class essays, for discovery, etc. 
Um, and I think this has been a challenge for libraries for a long time, you know, even ahead of large language models. How do we educate the student about Google Scholar, knowing that they're going to use that and we have all these, you know, licensed databases? And so I, I, I think, you know, recognizing that these tools are out there, that they're going to be out there, that they're accessible by students, libraries should start to, you know, learn what are the strengths of them, what are the weaknesses of them, and develop, you know, material trainings framework uh, to address some of these. And and I think, you know, that's kind of been my perspective of the role of libraries for a long time is, is helping guide researchers and students through this whole suite of, you know, databases, tools, publications. And so, you know, their their role is, is more important than ever because these tools are hard to understand sometimes. Um, and, and, you know, it's hard to understand how they can be used, you know, responsibly and, and what are the challenges we should watch out for, uh, et cetera. Thanks so much, Josh. Yeah, I think uh, 30 minutes is about to be up, actually. That goes by so quickly. <laughs> um, did anyone have any final comments? Um, yeah, Brian, you have your hand up. Just, just real quick, in, in terms of how vendors can contribute to library needs, I think increasingly libraries need to um, basically get out there engaged in, and engage their constituencies in new and novel ways. And I think that our relationship with open syllabus is allowing that. Um, and it's it, even beyond the example that I gave, we are also uh, able now to reach out to our Office of Institutional Effectiveness, which is our accrediting unit under the provost office. And there's talks about um, the learning outcomes that can be parsed and analyzed from syllabi. But also I look at what Josh uh, has done and I was very impressed with his AI chatbot integration. Um, and I asked questions about uh, rapid intensification of hurricanes and it really did a, uh, some really interesting and good work in terms of helping, I think, a student get started on a quality paper. Uh, so I think that a relationship like that is very useful. Uh, Mirage uh, Overton's work is also extremely impressive to show the extended scholarly impact of what faculty are doing out there through those public policy and other policy documents. Uh, so you three and your three companies can really, I think, help libraries make that kind of extra engagement reach and to get involved in other areas that libraries might typically uh, not be involved with. And I think that that's useful for the health of libraries in the future. Perfect, thanks so much, Brian. That's a perfect wrapping up point <laughs> for us. Um, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, and hopefully we didn't go over by too much. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today and uh, please, reach out to any of us who you're interested in talking more about this with. And I didn't, uh, as a moderator, I didn't really talk that much about Overton, but you can definitely reach out to me uh, and ask more questions about our commitment to being a responsible data provider and what that means in our tool and database. Um, so great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.